Hey, what's up, everybody? It's Kellen here from Start Your Systems, and welcome to Track Walk episode 89 in MX Simulator. We're looking at uh, the biggest track there is in MX Simulator. There's actually bigger maps, but this is the biggest track, um, and it's called the Swedish Enduro Round 1. I think the name in game is like Swedish Enduro Round 1 Vist Track by Mecha96. And uh, just to give you guys an idea on the scaling of this track, it is 156 hectare, which um, is only about 1.25 kilometers squared, which doesn't maybe sound like a whole lot, but it's actually over 16 million square miles. And um, <clears throat> it's, uh, I, I looked up hectare and it also came out that it's like 386 acres too, so just to think of like, land mass if you guys own land or anything like that um, acres is usually what they go off of judging by how big an, a land area is and that's how big this is is about 386 acres so it's freaking huge it's long I think one lap on this usually I mean it's in the past taken me roughly 12 13 minutes which doesn't again seem that long but it's not a terribly hard track there's a few really tough sections and sure we'll get to those at some point but the uniqueness of it is that it is so big is that it just kind of feels like it goes on and on forever and it's uh it's really it's cool that people do stuff like this i feel like in this game where they like push the boundaries of what sim can do usually a track like this it's going to be too hard on a computer so people tend to shy away from making maps this large but this guy, Mecha96, has also made an, a couple of other tracks before. And he posted on the thread about this track that he did everything he could to keep the um, uh, textures and stuff down and scale and stuff like that so that you wouldn't have as many lag problems. I mean, I'm running my game at full graphics right now. Not my graphics card maxed out, but just the game at full graphics. So, um, I mean, it works. It's working fine right now. But I'd imagine with anybody more than myself or maybe a few people on this, my card would probably think I'm trying to kill it because it usually doesn't like to load this many textures and then try to play it with people. I'm also riding a 252 stroke since last week at Millville because um, the 450 class had to make up the Millville motos. Uh, told my friend Nate who rides two strokes all the time that if I didn't score points in the first moto that I'd ride a two stroke in the second moto. I got 19th in the first moto, but <clears throat> still just wanted to ride a two-stroke anyway because I was pretty much over it. And we had all those server issues again, so I don't even know if the second moto is going to count, but unofficially I finished ninth on a two-stroke. Two but it was because the server was lagging so bad is probably why I did so good, and some people didn't get counted, so I don't know if you pan it back and actually see what I got is probably somewhere in like the 15 to 16 range. Um, but, uh, I mean, it why not ride a two-stroke it's an enduro track a lot of people ride two strokes when they ride enduro stuff because it's lighter more agile it gets on the power sooner um, four strokes are kind of hard to lug around and stuff especially on like logs and stuff so ride the two smoke so I just made like a kind of a elongated left hand turn and that was coming from pretty much what's like the farthest bottom right hand corner of this map. Um, there's like a little grid up in the upper right hand corner of the screen that you can kind of see an arrow moving around. That's where the map like is supposed to be. He just didn't actually like lay out the track design. But that was about the farthest right like lower right hand corner that you'll get on this map and now we're like right in the center which is more or less like this kind of sand wash thing uh oh that's not good oh boy front end just landed cock sideways and hooked a right that was interesting so there's this like sand wash area which i'm gonna try to get back up to where i just was and i made it but it's got a couple unique sections in this area which i enjoy that he took the time to make there's this cool thing which is like you could either hug the corner tight or go around the berm i'm gonna do i'm probably gonna do two laps so we'll see what, what happens when i come back but this one it says slow down so you have to just tiptoe off the top and you got a big drop down into i guess it's like a quarry i don't really know if that's like the right way to put it but 
It's just like this big gaping hole. It's got a couple uh, switchback things going on here. And then to get out of it, you also have to go up another really big wall. But you'll see that when we get there. Oh, come on, front end, quit locking. Oh, am I not going to make that? Alright, so you just got to tap the throttle so that it slowly backs up. And then you can turn it. Alright, let's get a drive. And easily made it that time. Almost went a little bit too far. Now I have gone too far because the bike just doesn't want to turn right now. Fucking turn! What the fuck? Why well, won't it turn around? It's like gripping the front wheel so that it won't turn around. Right, I'm just going to hold it wicked. Alright, and we drop back down into the little valley here. And it's like a tabletop down into a U-turn. I've played this track four or five times before, never with people, just by myself because, I mean, I don't know if it's ever been on a server or if anybody's ever raced it. I'd imagine that this is going to be like one of the standard tracks that people use when they run Enduro Series now, but we haven't ran an Enduro Series yet this year, and this track came out this year, so I'm not sure what's going to happen with that. So this is the part where it comes down, you pick a lane through here, and at first I didn't know where to go on this because it just kind of ended, but you're supposed to just go straight up, get to the very top, and land it, and hook it right. It's kind of like just going up a straight up wall almost. And then you're out of the sand wash and onto the uh, grass single track stuff once again. Up, 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 tiptoeing in. Up, oh, front end lock just killing me, and I set it up. The biggest downfall I would say that this track has is that these sections are so tight and there's no ruts, so it kind of doesn't really flow in any shape or form. You have to make it work yourself, which I mean, that it's kind of an enduro standpoint anyway. You don't always just have it your way with nice ruts and lush corners and stuff like that. But I think in enduro tracks and stuff like that, you know, people do trial runs of the track before the races and stuff, so ruts develop and you can kind of get established lines, but this is just all flat ground uh, corners, and the off-camber stuff is really tricky because there's nothing to turn off of, and the traction is kind of slippery. I'm not sure what type of traction it is, but it's not the easiest traction to na navigate. So this kind of section through here you're just kind of weaving back and forth on yourself a little bit and I think as soon as I come over this rise there's like a little switchback section maybe I oh, know wait it's down in that canyon back there but I guess I have to go this way first so we're gonna go this way and go this way so uh if you've made it this far in the video, I haven't even explained why we're doing a track walk on this track yet. Uh, it's because we got another week off in nationals. We're going to have three nationals to go after this one. Um, but Loretta Lynn's is starting this week. Actually started today. I'm recording this on Tuesday. Track walk comes out every Wednesday. Um, but Loretta Lynn's this week kicking off. And uh, not really a, like anything super shocking going on at the ranch this year, I don't think. Um, pretty straightforward. Of uh, the guys that are expected to contend, I guess. Um, Chase Sexton is supposed to be like the next big deal. Um, he and Charbonneau both were like Geico's top amateurs, which Charbonneau obviously turned pro at, at uh, Hangtown this year. So I believe the plan is Sexton to race uh, the last three nationals after Loretta's, you know, given that he uh, doesn't get hurt at Loretta's. Um, but Team Green having Forkner go through doesn't have anybody else really coming right now, from my knowledge. And I believe Mitchell Harrison was Yamaha's top guy, but obviously he moved up. So I'm trying to think who else they have. They have like a couple guys like John John Ames and stuff like that, but I don't think they're yet ready to move up. That's kind of like the story that's going on in Loretta's with the A classes. And then B and C is always kind of a crapshoot on who's going to do well. I went to Loretta's in 2014 and Sharpno destroyed the B class. So. 
That's always interesting. This is like the coolest part of the track in my opinion. It's this like long, flowy road type thing running alongside. Oh, oh. Running alongside these telephone poles. Goes all the way down here. And you're supposed to make a left turn. Not go straight. And then you haul ass back. Oh, don't get a hook. Oh, land it. Oh. <laughs> Almost done with the lap, so actually this lap is going by a little bit faster than I thought it might. But that's okay, because then it gives me a whole nother lap to continue speaking things to you fine people. Oh. Um, but yeah, Loretta's same old, same old. Um, you know, Super Minis. Uh, I don't think Ryder DeFrancesco is up there yet, but he's kind of supposed to be the next Pastrana Carmichael type person. Oh, front flip for days. Got Jet Reynolds coming up. And then you got just a bunch of people that are, it might be in like 250B or something, but they might still be in Super Minis. Like uh, Cantrell, actually, yeah, he's 250B. Uh, uh, Lance Kobush, I think, is one kid's name. Um, trying to think. I usually know the amateur scene really well, but it's slipping my mind some of the names of these kids that I'm supposed to be thinking about. So, I apologize for everybody that's going to be like, well, what about said person? And as soon as you say the person's name, I'll be like, oh yeah, this is what he's doing, that's what, blah, 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 but... I don't know, I'm kind of not paying super attention to anything in the moto industry lately. But I'll watch Loretta's and get the gist of it and everything like that. And a lap is complete, so this is going to come across here. 11.45 was, uh, 11.34 was the first lap, so... See if we can beat that time. And I'll talk about, in the meantime, another uh, happening that's going on in the motor world right now that uh, includes my favorite racing event that happens every year, and that is the Motocross Donations because Team France has now picked their Motocross Donations team. Uh, they released, I believe, a statement this morning, Tuesday. Uh, actually, maybe it was yesterday. So I'm trying to think. They released a statement uh, announcing the team, and uh, I'd like to say I'm surprised, but I'm kind of not. It's going to be Roman Fevre, the defending MXGP world champ who probably won't win it this year, who will be in the MXGP class. So for those of you that don't understand how the designations work, there's three races, um, and there's three riders for each country. There's the MXGP class, the MX2 class, and the MX Open class, which basically MX Open is just another refined MXGP class because it's all, all everybody on a 450. So it's basically like one 450 class, one 250 class, and one open class, but the open class is usually all 450 riders. Anyway, the races usually go as follows where it is MXGP and MX2 is race one, MX2 and MX open is race two, and MXGP and MX open is race three. So usually the best 450 riders in the world are the ones that decide the finale because that's race three. Anyway, France picked their team. Roman Fevre, MXGP class, he'll be running number one because France won last year. Surprise, surprise, anybody that hasn't been paying attention or living under a rock, France won last year and the year before that. Fevre will be number one. Dylan Ferrandis, the Monster Energy KRT Kawasaki MX2 rider, will be number two. Any of you American fans that have no idea who Dylan Ferrandis is or may be, better get prepared to hear that name a lot because he's going to be on Star Racing Yamaha next year in the United States racing... Uh, 250 west or east supercross and then 250 outdoors and the kid is good he uh in some cases has straight up beat jeffrey hurlings who in my opinion uh even over cooper webb is the best 250 rider in the world and when he moves up to the 450 class could very well be the best rider in the world um when he's not hurt but anyway brandis can usually go toe to toe quite well with hurlings not beat him very often but can sometimes and Frandis is pretty freaking good indoors too because the only time we've ever seen him on American soil was when he just qualified randomly in 2014 at the Monster Cup and finished like 15th um, just like showed up had some support I think from Mitch Payton at Pro Circuit but not much more than that and 
uh, went out there with the best Supercross riders in the world on that track and did pretty well. So I think he's going to be a force to be reckoned with in Supercross. And I'm rambling again because I haven't announced the third rider on France's team, uh, which might surprise some people. But like I said, not really that surprised. MX open class rider will be Gautier Paulin on the HRC Factory Honda team. Uh, and a lot of people may be like, what the hell? Why is Marvin Muscan not on the team? And uh, you'd be right in thinking that. That's a very logical question to ask. Paulin has had a pretty rough year, to be honest. Injured at one point. Uh, came back. Hasn't really ridden to his fullest potential. Um, only on sand tracks have we really seen him kind of show because he's really good on sand. Other than that, not that good. And the race this year is in Majora in Italy. So um, not that Muscan is great in the sand or anything. Or uh, not... So what am I thinking? Not that Muscan is uh, just like the bee's knees on Major and that there's no explanation why they shouldn't have picked him, but Paulin having the year that he's had versus Muscan finishing, uh, I think, third in Supercross. Third or... F no, f no, I think it was third because Tomac was hurt at one point, wasn't he? Well, he was in the top five, got rookie of the year, and then outdoors right now, sitting third in the championship again and is legitimately uh, giving Roxon and Tomac something to think about every time he starts up front. So um, I, th I think that it w they're missing out by picking Paul Ann over Muscan, but I can understand why they'd pick Paulin because Paulin has been on the team the last three or four years, maybe even longer than that. I'm trying to think of a team that he hasn't been on recently. Uh, but the last two years in particular that they won, when they won... Um, in Germany and then they won uh, no the, I'm sorry when they won in Kegums in Latvia and then they won last year at Rene in France uh, Paulin was one of the big guys on the team to kind of carry them he was the team captain he ran the number one plate last year at France um, so you know the French people love Gautier Paulin and I don't think that they'll be super sad about not seeing Muscan there as Muscan kind of pissed off the French Federation by jumping ship from the GPs and coming to the States in the first place. Usually the reason that Christophe Porcel hasn't been picked for this, uh, but you know, that's that's going to be the team. No Muscan. They got Paulin and Fevre on 450s and Frandis on a 250, which like I said, I think Frandis on 250 is totally fine. He's a very capable rider. Um, if you know, you could maybe make a statement that the team that they ran last year, which was Fevre, Paulin, and Muscan on a 250, should or could still happen because I'm sure Muscan's very talented on a 250. But you just want to keep those guys on their same bikes, usually, especially uh, if they go from a 250 to a 450. It seems like it's usually a little bit of an easier jump to make than a 450 to a 250. So we'll see, and we'll see whether or not. Uh, the USA puts up a team that really can challenge them. Uh, USA did finish second last year, so they'll be four, five, and six on the number scale. And uh, I mean, it, it's going to be tough. They're not going to have Dungey again, so this will be the second year in a row that Dungey won't be going. So, you know, on, on paper, it looks as though they're going to pick something like a Tomac for MX uh, GP. He'll run number four, and then they would pick. I'm thinking they're probably going to go with Jeremy Martin, Jeremy or Alex Martin, one of the Martin brothers, maybe Savachi, but I doubt it, for uh, MX2, and then put Cooper Webb back in the MX3 slash MX Open class, which is what he did last year for us when we sent Barsha, J Mart, and Webb, and Webb was on a 450. And I can see that team being good, but it challenge, you know, winning again could be a stretch with France um, it I think France once again will completely uh, be up to whether or not Gautier Paulin rides like he can at the destinations because he is a race winning caliber rider and person and if he rides like that then I think France will be unbeatable to be honest with you I think Fevre when he's just right near the top of his game is one of if not the best riders in the world maybe only beat getting beat by Tim Geyser right now because I think Geyser's skill and speed and everything like that him and Roxon are very close I would say speed wise right now um, just kind of from an outsider's perspective I'd love 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 it if Ken Roxon went and raced for Germany this year because he hasn't the last two years 
but I doubt that's going to happen given that he'll uh, be moving to HRC and that deal will be done on usually it's the first of October and the designations will be right about then if not right before right after so I think he'll just be focusing on moving to his new team won't race for Germany again so we'll be stuck without the AMA motocross champion um, again because Dungey didn't show up last year and Roxon won't show up this year probably but who knows he might we'll see if he does the German team could be good could be bad it'll just be him Noggle and probably like Brian Sue or something like that but they're usually not a super contender it's usually Belgium that shows up and is the the guys or the team that really shines through as a team that's uh, the challengers if you will for France and the USA but I think once again it'll be a France USA showdown it's in Majora in Italy um, so it'll be home track advantage for Tony Cairoli which could be cool for Italy because I think Cairoli's kind of running down onto his last leg here. Um, with Geyser perhaps going out of MXGP next year to move to the States, I think Cairoli could still have a shot at one more world title before it, it's time to hang up the boots, but right now it's not looking like that's going to happen. So maybe one more Dis Nations win for Cairoli, that'd be pretty cool, but we'll see. He usually doesn't have a very strong team built around him, um, as the Italians are kind of mediocre but they're, they're I mean they're okay like I think the best they've ever done with Cairoli on the team was finished on the podium once but I'm already excited for Dis Nations I know that's a long ways out the GP season still has like five more rounds to go AMA still has three rounds to go so we're not quite there yet but now that the France MX Dis Nations team has been announced it's kind of got me all thinking about how it's going to work out who's going to do what what the teams will be like it, it I mean I say Team USA probably going to be Webb on a 450, but it could be not that at all. It could totally just be that they pick Barsha again or, or go out of left field and, and uh, I don't know, pick Kennard or something. I, you know, something strange. Put him on a 450 and leave Webb on a 250, given that Webb is probably on par with Hurling's uh, on a on a track like Majora, if not just barely off, so he could be the second best MX2 rider. Given that Hurlings is healthy by then, we're still not really sure what is what the deal is with with Hurlings and his collarbone and all that good stuff. Or what did he break his leg? Something. Anyway, that's my spiel about the Motocross the Nations. Of course, we'll do like a full Motocross the Nations preview once all the teams are figured out. Jeremy and I will probably go through it and give you guys a good synopsis. But I used this entire second lap to talk about it, and now I'm done. So this has been Trackwalk episode 89 on Swedish Enduro Round 1, the Vist track. And I think this lap is going to be slightly better. Yep, 11.11.2. If you guys like this video, please like, comment, and subscribe. And we'll get back to you guys with any questions, comments, or concerns that you have. And uh, thanks for watching Trackwalk episode 89 here on the Swedish Enduro by Mecha96. We'll see you guys on the next one.